Exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. I'll read it again. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Great is the Lord God Almighty. He is here with us. He dwells, he dwells within us. Great is the Lord. He is worthy, church. God gave me that word this week, worthy. He is so worthy, yet we feel, you know, he he says we are worthy of, you know, all he's done for us, but I don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy. But God is worthy. He is worthy. So we're going to lift up our praise to Him today because of Him, because of who He is, because of what Jesus did on the cross. He is so worthy, church. We're introducing a new song today called Who Else? And it just says, who else is worthy? No one is worthy but Jesus. Who else is 
your praise, speak out your praise. If you speak in tongues, speak or sing in tongues of praise to the Heavenly Father. Who else is worthy? Hey, we praise, we praise, we praise. Praise to your Father. We praise, we praise, we praise. We praise you. 
God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is the God that we serve, church that He can be exalted, but then also show us that how, how humble and, and honouring He can be, that He loved each and every one of us. And I wanna remind you this morning that He sees you and He cares for you. 
and He loves you as His son or as His daughter. He loves you. And I thank You, God, that You gave Your Son, that He came down to earth to be amongst Your people, God, that He sacrificed His life for us, God, for each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are worthy of all praise and that you love us, Father. You know us and you love us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's so good to have you with us today. Find your seats. Is there anyone new or visiting with us? If you can give us a wave. If there's anyone new and visiting online, give us a comment. Thank you. I also need to find my notes, so apologies. Give me one sec. Okay, so if you are new or visiting, welcome. My name is Emma, and it's great to have you here. We do have a slide coming up behind me that will basically show you what the QR code in the front of your seat uh, will share with you. And this is, if you click on it, you can find anything that you want to about East Coast, which is amazing. So if you want to be part of a connect group, if you want to serve, if you want a prayer request as well, make sure you use that QR code. Um, A slide will come up around tithes, so we do have our white box up the back, but we also do tithes online as well there for your convenience. We are having coffee in the backyard today. Woo-woo! It's a beautiful day out there, so make sure after the service you head out the back. Uh, We have our prayer, pre-service prayer every Sunday morning in the auditorium at 9.30 a.m., so make sure that you join us. It is open for everyone. Um, So come in at 9.30 and pray with us. We also have Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. If you can join us online via Zoom, which is awesome. This is a really exciting one. So there's been multiple prophecies about May, the coming month, which is amazing. And just the Spirit of God is ready to do something in May. And so Lou's organized, Pastor Lou has organized a, uh, a prayer meeting for us on Tuesday night this week. Uh, it's going to be in the back, I was going to say back auditorium, back factory, yeah. Um, so behind here, uh, behind this building on 7 p.m. this Tuesday. So if you want to come join, pray with us, it's going to be an anointed time. We have our seniors morning tea this Wednesday at 10 a.m. It's actually going to be, and I left my other note, it's behind me. Bass and Flinders uh, in San Susi. So if you do uh, need any help getting there, if you need directions or anything like that, reach out to Jane and Meg uh, this week and they will give you some more info. Uh, and then we have Youth is back this week. <laughs> Amazing. I was like, look there, I was like, there's no one there. Um, so this is, it'll be in the factory out the back, which is amazing. Um, and I think that is it for all the, all the announcements. So we're going to welcome Pastor Lou for the final a- announcement. Give her a round of applause. Thanks, Emma. Uh, This is just to save the date for those that like to be organised. This is a fantastic opportunity. Welcome back, Phil and Wendy Job, by the way, from your travels. And it's just, you know, we've been praying for you, Wendy, and we're just believing that God's going to keep healing you and just that you had a touch even as we worshipped that you will not only recover but be strong and healthy in Jesus' name. Um, Save the date. If you are a diary person, this is a fantastic opportunity. Pastor Nikki Dent, uh, who was one of my dear friends, but I would say arguably one of the best teachers in our nation around sexuality. She's written a book uh, called Breaking Up with Babel, and she's going to be filming her curriculum for the book here with a live audience. So over the Friday night, the 31st of May, and then uh, Saturday, the 1st of June, not very clean. We've got two months with one event, very confusing. Um, 
in the afternoon, after sport, before dinner, we're going to be having uh, filming the sessions in here. This is an opportunity for to come along for a free event. But if you are a parent, a young adult, this is the why behind our what. We, why no sex before marriage? Why is sex sacred for marriage? Why covenant marriage? Why is marriage even important? These are the things that she's going to cover. She is an expert on, pardon me, I just spat, um, identity. Uh, She's going to speak into the image of God and gender. So that is Friday night and Saturday afternoon. I'm letting you know early because this is a, a fantastic opportunity, I believe, for all of us to be equipped really on biblical foundations. So if you want to come along, it's open. Uh, to, it's just a privilege. God's given us the opportunity to have this partnership with her. So we're going to film the curriculum, but it's a free event for our church members. And I will uh, extend it to some other people in the Uh, faith community that it would be relevant for. But that is a save the date so you don't miss out. And for youth parents, it's going to run perfectly at the same time as the youth program. So you can attend that on the Friday night. And we might open it to senior highs as well uh, at parents' discretion. So that's just the save the date. It's my privilege this morning. We have Pastor Tom preaching for the first time. Uh, in the house, and I will let him introduce himself, but if you don't know, Tom is a new member to our team, has been a part of our church for a number of years, but he is a pastor, he's our young adults pastor, and also our Sunday services, but he his incredible gift mix because he's so strategic and organised, but very pastoral, so he's been the blessing of God to us. But would we give him a warm welcome this morning as he comes and brings the word? Thank you, Pastor Lou. And I really want to honour Pastor Lou and Felix just even for this opportunity. Like, thank you so much for trusting me. You guys are amazing pastors, and it's so incredible that we get to be a part of this house, and we're so blessed and thankful for that. So thank you. Um, Church, it's an incredible opportunity to be here with you this morning and to share the word. And I'm really excited, and this word is something that's really been burning in my heart for a little while now. And as things have just rolled on and lined up, it's just become an incredible opportunity to share that. But I thought it'd also be a good opportunity to share a little bit about myself and about who I am because unfortunately there's a lot of you I haven't had the chance to properly meet yet and I hope to get to know you better. There is going to be a photo that goes up on the screen behind me of myself and my lovely wife, Tian. Um, She is my better half. She is the person that keeps me in check. She's also the person that tells me when I say something that sounds a little harsh. She's the much kinder version of of our marriage. She's the nice person. We've been married for four and a half years and it's been a really exciting time being married together. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know some of you are going to ask, no, we don't have kids yet. We're enjoying this season of marriage and it's just a really incredible time. So we've been a part of East Coast since uh, May 2021. We moved and joined this community and it's been an incredible time. It's been really exciting. We've got the opportunity to grow through a lot, to move through some of the things and just to really step in to a new season in this now that God's calling us to. About me, I got saved when I was 14 years old when I walked into youth ministry. I had a friend who pestered me for a month about coming to youth. Oh, sorry, I correct myself, a term about coming to youth. Every Friday, are you coming to youth? No. Are you coming to youth? No. Are you coming to youth? No. I kept that up for a solid term until I finally caved in and said, fine, I will come this once and then you can stop asking me. Well, I went once I encountered the love of God and I never left. So praise God. I want to encourage those senior high people that are in this room right now. Don't pester your friends, but keep inviting them. Just keep inviting them because you never know what God is going to do when they do actually come. So I got saved at 14, been walking with the Lord and got the incredible opportunity at our previous church to be a part of the pastoral team is there as well and, and really got to grow and flourish and then God moved us on and that's how we came to East Coast. But this morning's exciting. I wasn't actually meant to be preaching this morning, but through what God has been doing and the words that God's been putting in my heart, and as I mentioned before, this word is something that's really been kind of growing in me in this past season and really been challenging me individually. And about a week and a half ago, I shared it with Pastor Lou and then other prophetic words have come about and it's really lined up and just feels like this morning is the right morning to share this. 
So let's lean in together this morning. If you have your Bible or you want to turn on your digital Bible, we're going to read out of 2 Kings 13 together this morning. It is going to come up on the screen behind me. So while you're finding that in your Bible, I want to give you a little bit of context this morning about what's happening in the scriptures we read together. So King Joash comes to the prophet Elijah. Now Israel as a nation had been in sin, rebelling against God and worshipping false gods, and they're about to go to war. Elisha is old and about to die. And this is where we pick up our passage in verse 14. So 2 Kings 13, we're going to read from 14 to 19. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrow. So he took a bow and arrow. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands, and he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, uh, sorry, yeah, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow, over, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, take the arrow, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. I titled this message this morning, Strike and Strike Again. You know, I love the word of God that we can read a passage over and over again and then all of a sudden, you read that same passage, and it's like the words jump off the page at you and really just hit you. And you're like, whoa. You know, God loves to bring revelation to us through His Word right in the time that we need it, in the season when we need it. And I love that fact that the Word of God is active and alive. And as you continue to read it, that God's going to continue to reveal more to you for what you need when you need. So this morning, I want to challenge you and ask you, Will you lean in this morning? Some of you, you may have heard this passage a number of times. You may have read through it a number of times, or you might be here for the first time this morning and have never heard this passage. I want to ask you, will you lean in? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and challenge you individually this morning? So verse 14. Now when Elijah had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel, and its horsemen. This is a really significant moment for Israel. See, they'd been rebelling against the Lord and been in sin. And in this moment, we see that Joash sees their need for the Lord's help. So he turns to the prophet Elijah. What's really interesting is the fact that for about a 43-year period in Scripture, we have no record of what Elisha was actually doing. 43 years, there's no record in the Bible between the previous moment and this moment. The statement that King Joash actually starts with is very significant, which is, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. These were the very words that Elisha himself had used to his teacher, Elijah, just before he was taken up in a whirlwind to be with the Lord. We see this in 2 Kings 2, 11 to 12. And they went on and talked. Behold, chariots of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. How interesting it is that the king uses the very words Elijah had spoken to Elijah. Bible commentators say that Elisha depicted Elijah as embodying the true strength of a nation. Or Elisha saw that the strength of Israel had been that of the presence of the prophet of God. He saw that the strength of the nation was not in its armies, not in its possessions, not in its walls, but the strength of the nation was in the prophet of God. We see all throughout Scripture that prophets and men of God listened to the Lord for the battle plan and through their obedience, they saw victory with the Lord. 
You know, Joshua and Israel in Joshua 6, they have the craziest battle plan ever. If you go to battle with this plan, I, I think some people would think you're a little bit crazy, but God gave them the battle plan. I want you to walk around the wall once a day for six days and on the seventh day do it six times and lift up a shout, blow the ram's horn and the walls came down. Imagine being the people in Jericho, what they would have thought. What's these people walking around for? Like, and they're doing it again? Like, aren't they meant to be attacking us? Shouldn't they be trying to dig under the wall, trying to go over the wall or trying to break down the wall? But they're walking around the wall. Craziest battle plan ever. But God came through. They did as the Lord had instructed them to do. In this moment in our passage, we see that Joash really comes to that realisation that he needs the Lord's guidance for victory in the battle. Let's continue in our passage this morning in 15 and 16. And Elijah said to him, take a bow and arrow. So he took a bow and arrow. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands. Now, this seems like a very simple act, taking a bow and drawing it. But it had a symbolic representation. It was common for a nation that was about to go to war to actually draw a bow and an arrow or take a spear and actually fire it into the direction of the land they were about to go to war against. It's a very significant moment. And the last part of this verse is actually very significant as well. When Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands. See, Elijah laying his hands was not to actually offer the king strength because Elijah's old and he's ill. How much strength would he have actually had? I like this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says, Not because he could lend much strength, for he was an old man, but because this signified that God would be with the king and that the power which dwelt in the prophets, God would come through the prophet's hands to the king. It's a powerful moment of the prophet Elijah showing them that God would be with them. Verse 17, And he said, Open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. Elijah strengthened the king, declaring victory for them over Syria. Here we see the promise of God come, the promise that they would have victory. We're going to continue in verse 18. And he said, take the arrow, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you'd made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. Here we see Joash makes a mistake. It can be easy to look at this story and think that Joash was actually hard done by. The prophet didn't say to him how many times to strike the ground. He just said, strike the ground. Striking the ground here is not as simple as we may think. It's not simply taking the arrow and actually whacking it next to you on the ground. It was actually taking the arrow and shooting it out the window. We see Joash only did it three times and stopped. Elijah didn't tell him how many times to strike. He just told him to strike. Bible commentator David Gartsey writes this. Elijah clearly asked Joash to do something that modelled prayer. Shooting the arrow required effort and aim. Shooting the arrows required instruction and help from the prophet of God. Shooting the arrow had to be done through an open window. Shooting the arrows had to be done without knowing the exact outcome ahead of time. The target was only fully known by faith. I love that. The target was only fully known by faith. Failing to shoot the arrow hurts others, not only himself. When God gives us a promise for something, or when God gives us prophetic insight or vision for something, he's inviting us to partner with him which requires us to have faith and obedience 
to what He has spoken, no matter how long it takes. We need to keep going until the Lord tells us to stop or the Lord comes through with what He has promised. We can't stop in the middle. We're going to go back to the story of Joshua and the Israelites. We're going to read out of Joshua 6 together, verses 3 and 5, where Joshua is given the crazy battle plan. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, going around the city once. Thus shall you do six six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of trumpets, then all the people shall shout a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall flat down. So the Israelite army and the seven priests will march around the wall with the ark. Once a day, six days, on the seventh day, the seventh time round to blow that blast of the trumpet to shout and the walls would come down. I ask you the question though, what if they'd given up after day two? What if they'd given up after day three or day four? Or what if they went, you know what, day five, we're going to walk around seven times and then we're going to go and blow the trumpet. Would the walls have come down? No, because that wasn't the instruction that had been given by God. The instruction was once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh, then blow the trumpet. They were obedient to what God had instructed them to do. They saw the promise of the Lord come through when they were obedient. King David, he was in the wilderness hiding after he'd been anointed as king. The current King Saul was pursuing him, trying to kill him. Imagine that. God's promise has come saying you're going to be king and now you're being pursued for your own life because the current king is still alive. He had to wait for the promise of God. But not only did he have to wait for it, he had to be faithful and obedient in the waiting. What would have happened if David had actually given up in the wilderness himself? We wouldn't see King David come to the authority and the place that the Lord had actually called him to. Returning to our passage this morning as we finish the final verse, verse 19. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you'll strike down Syria only three times. We see from the king's disobedience that all of Israel missed out on the fullness of victory that God had for them. You know, today I really believe the Lord wants to stir us to keep going and to not stop short of what He has for us. You know, there's been many words spoken about this coming month of May, but we actually need to lean in. We need to lean into what God's calling us to do. We need to lean in and seek Him. We need to lean in and pray for what the plans and the things that He wants to do through us. It's going to be a very exciting season, but we need to make sure we've heard and we've been obedient to listen to what He wants to do in this next season. We need to keep praying as a church. We need to keep praying and seeking the Lord individually too. We need to make sure we make time in our quiet place in the unseen, to seek the Lord in prayer. You know, I want to encourage you individually, keep believing for the things that God has put on your heart. Keep believing for those around you. I want to encourage you that, and I really feel this, that God actually wants to breathe upon dreams that He placed in people's hearts previously. I really believe there's people in here this morning that you were given words long ago about the things that God has for you, but you've let those things go dormant. I believe God wants to breathe upon that and He wants you to begin to start seeking Him all over again. Would you take your bow, would you take your arrow and would you begin to fire? Can we remember that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting a spiritual battle? Prayer is what will change the battle. Because it's not what we do, it's who we're praying to and who we're seeking. Let's remember that prayer does not need to be something of complex words and sound pretty and fancy, but it's actually about the heart in which you're praying to the Lord with. I want to encourage you with my own kind of testimony of this last season. Maddie, if you'd join me, please. My wife and I, when we left our previous church, we left and we, we knew it was the right time and the Lord had called us to leave. 
But that was a really difficult thing to do when I was in a pastoral position and I knew that God had called me to be a pastor. I left with no other pastoral position to go to. I left and had to go find corporate work and God provided and God has been so faithful. But in that place, I was lost in going, God, I have these words. You've called me to be a pastor. You've called me to lead people. You've called me to shepherd people. But what am I doing in this place? God, I know it's more than just leading a connect group in in speaking into people's lives. I know it's more than that, but I can't see it right now. And I actually started to doubt my own calling in God. I started to doubt the words that had been given to me. I started to doubt what God was actually wanting to do through my life. And I remember it would be only the second or third Sunday that my wife and I were here. I was sitting about the third row. And this message that I bring this morning is something I'd actually shared out of before. And I remember the Lord actually drew me to it. And the past two and a half years, the Lord has continued to bring me back to this. Tom, keep going. Tom, keep seeking me. Tom, keep praying. Tom, keep pursuing me for what I have for you and for your life. Don't stop seeking me. I'm going to read a quote by Leonard Ravenhill. The two prerequisites to successful Christian living are vision and passion, both of which are born and maintained by prayer. The ministry of preaching is open to few. The ministry of prayer, the highest ministry of all human offices, is open to all. Every single one of you can pray. God wants to hear from every single one of you. God wants to use every single one of you. Where He has placed you right now, He wants to use you. The dreams He's put in your heart, He wants to bring to fruition. The things you're believing for, God wants to bring to fruition, but you need to be faithful to seek Him. Individually, what are you believing for? Are you believing for prodigals to come home? Are you believing for your family to be saved? It's a constant prayer of mine and my wife for our families to be saved because they don't know Him. Are you believing for your neighbours to come to the Lord, the very people you live next to? Are you believing for brokenness to be restored in your family, brokenness to be restored in your own life? Are you believing for healing and breakthrough? Are you believing for the promises of God to come to pass? Church, would we not stop short of what God has for us individually? Would we not stop short of what God has for this house and this church in this location? Would we not stop short of what God has for our nation? Because God's not finished. While the world might grow darker outside, our hope should grow brighter because we're strengthened in prayer. We're strengthened in faith. Ask the band, would you join me as we, as we come to a close and we come to a time to actually pray together this morning. With every single promise we have from the Lord, with every dream we have in God, every prophetic word we receive, we have a responsibility to be faithful and obedient to seek the Lord. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. We need to be faithful to continue to strike the ground to strike the ground again, to strike the ground again, and to keep on striking until the promises of the Lord come. Will we not stop short, church? Psalm 18, 25. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To those with integrity, you show integrity. Church, will we stand together this morning? I want to invite those this morning who want prayer for the things and the dreams in their own heart that they know God has been bringing and reminding them of. Would you actually pursue the Lord in that this morning? God is not finished in what He wants to do in you. I believe God also wants to to speak new dreams over people, to give new promises over people this morning. So as the band plays, I want to give that space and I want to invite you to come forward and pray together. If you want to stay in your seats, pray together. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this morning. 
Father God, we thank You for Your words. We thank You for Your promises. Lord God, we thank You for the dreams, the visions that You've given to us as Your people. Lord God, we thank You that we get to partner with You. We get to do it with You. And Father God, I pray, would we be faithful in seeking You for all that You have. Lord, we thank You for all that has been spoken over this church for the month of May. Lord, we choose to believe for it and we choose to seek You for it. And Holy Spirit, we ask, would You come and do the work in our hearts this morning that only You can do. We honour You, we praise You in Your Son's mighty Name. Let's worship together, church.
this is really, um, it's a prophetic message over us this morning. I encourage you, there's some who have thought, I have sought the Lord in my younger age. I've been there, I've done that. It's now for someone else to do, but the Lord is calling you out. (laughs) He is saying, hide no more. I have called you to continue to intercede. I have called you in this season. Would you rise up and would would you strike the ground again by faith in Jesus' mighty name? And I just... I just felt to pray over a prophetic word. I think it was in 1997, Gordon Gibbs gave this church a prophetic word that we would be a conflagration of fire, that the Holy Spirit would really pour out in this space, that people would come and receive restoration. It would be a restoration of families. It would be a building up of people, that people would be drawn to be restored and then sent out. Father God, we strike again upon every promise that has been spoken and prayed over this church, Lord God. We strike again, Lord, of what has been spoken over Australia in generations and decades past of a great move of God. We strike again. We awaken from our sleep, our sleep of comfort, our sleep of complacency, uh, where we have been numb because we have been distracted, Lord. We awaken to what You are doing in this season, in this time, and we go by faith. Though none go with us, we will go and we will go by faith. Lord God, we pray that this would be a strike the ground season for us where we wouldn't stop. Though it's unclear how many times we go again, we throw out our nets again, we go by faith. We would be a community that lives by faith, that we would be a community that is marked by prayer. And I pray for the secret place, Lord. I pray for an awakening of prayer in the secret place from the youngest to the oldest in this church, I pray that we would be found in Your presence during the week, Lord. I break down every barrier that it has held us back from seeking Your face. And I thank You. I just have a picture from the youngest for our youth and our children that they're gonna start to seek God's face in the secret place to the eldest member of our church that they would seek the Lord in the secret place. Thank you, Jesus. We would be a community that is marked by prayer and that we would know you, Lord, that we would know your face and we would seek your face. Restore joy to this house. Restore passion, restore fire. Thank you, Lord. You're not invisible. This could be for just one or a few people. You are not invisible. You are not invisible to the Lord. You are not invisible to others. You are seen by God and you are seen by others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. There's a beautiful presence of God this morning. And if you want prayer, you felt too nervous, the front of the church will be open. You're welcome to come forward for prayer. Uh, Coffee will be in the backyard. And don't forget, if your children are around the side in the new factory, remember to collect them afterwards. God bless you guys. And we'll see you next week.